Hello, everyone. Welcome to Worship for Hope. I'm glad that you're watching. I pray that you will be strengthened and encouraged in this time together. Let's begin. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Sanctify us in your truth. Your word is truth. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, as now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. God speaks to us in his word first from the book of Daniel. That time Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. From the book of Hebrews, the 10th chapter. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more, as you see the day approaching. From the Gospel of St. Mark, the 13th chapter. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings? Replied Jesus. Not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are all about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at that time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. So says the word. We confess our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I want to encourage you today on the basis of our second lesson from the book of Hebrews, the 10th chapter. Before we get to the lesson, just a little bit of background about the book of Hebrews. It's important to understand what brings us to Hebrews 10 and also along with that, the entire book of Hebrews. Well, the book of Hebrews was written in the first century to a group of Christians who were also Jewish. So they had converted from Judaism to Christianity. Uh, the letter was written about 65, 66 AD. We don't know specifically who wrote it. There are a couple of really good theories or thoughts as to who did. But ultimately, who specifically wrote it doesn't really make a difference. What is significant is the content. And the book of Hebrews was written to these Jews who were thinking about going back to the Old Covenant. Uh, the Neronian persecutions were beginning, and so they thought, you know, I'm not, I'm not too overly thrilled about dying the death of a martyr. Why don't we just go back to that Old Covenant, that old way of worshiping? We'll identify not as Christians, but we'll identify as Jews. It seems like a win-win situation. We get to live, we don't die a horrible death, and it seems like they're pretty similar. Well, the writer to the Hebrews says to those Hebrew Christians, definitively not. The whole purpose of the Old Covenant was not to be an end unto itself, but the whole purpose of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, was to point ahead to Jesus Christ. And in Jesus Christ, we have the fulfillment of this covenant that was established by Moses and God's people at Mount Sinai 1,500 years prior. Now, the book of Hebrews looks at several key individuals and practices from the Old Testament. So, for instance, Moses. The book of Hebrews tells the readers and us Jesus is superior to Moses. The book of Hebrews talks about the high priest. The high priest, uh, Jesus is a better high priest than the ones that were established in the Old Testament. Uh, the rules and regulations that were imposed on God's people in the Old Testament their, their purpose was to point ahead to Christ. Now, in the Old Testament, there were several significant individuals. There was the prophet, priest, and king, and there was the tabernacle, and then later on, the temple. In the temple, the tabernacle, and then the temple, the the temple itself. There were two significant rooms. There was the holy place. The holy place was 30 feet by 90 feet, and the most holy place was 30 feet by 30 feet. First of all, the holy place. The holy place was a beautifully decorated. Um, it had a beautiful acacia wood, and the walls and the ceilings were made out of acacia wood, and they were covered with gold. And on this gold, there were hammered uh, cherubim and seraphim. So it, it looked 
truly like a picture of heaven, artist's rendering of it today. In this holy place, there were several significant things. First of all, there was this huge candelabra, this huge candelabra with, with seven candles in it, seven representing God's dealings with his Old Testament people. And they were huge candles. They weren't just small little tapers that we put on our dining room table or something like that. These were large candles. Every single day for 1,500 years, except when the exodus occurred and the temple was destroyed and a new one was built, these candles burned. These oil candles burned. And every single day, the priest would go into that holy place, check the oil, check the wicks, make sure that they had not gone out. It's very striking. When you think about it, for 1,500 years, these candles burned. Um, uh, in front of that, depending on your perspective, but in, in front of that was this table called the table of incense. And there was consistently aromatic incense that was being burned, symbolizing the prayers of the saints, the prayers of the Israelites ascending to the heavens. Opposite the, the cor opposite the side with the candelabra, there was the table of showbread. On the table of showbread, there were 12 loaves of bread. These loaves of bread were replaced every single day. The old uh, loaves were replaced with the new loaves that the priest had made that day. And just this whole concept of, of these, these Old Testament worship lives, you can see how Jesus alludes to them in the gospel, specifically in the gospel of John. So Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Jesus says, I am the bread of the world. Jesus says, I, as your good shepherd, will watch over and protect you. I will pray for you in your behalf to my dear heavenly Father and yours. So in the holy place, there are these allusions to the work that Jesus would accomplish, and Jesus himself references them. Uh, as, as a side point, in, the, in this holy place, Every single day, a priest was selected to go into that holy place, bring the prayers of the people, check the oil, replace the bread, and check on the incense. It was in this area that Zechariah was ministering when the angel Gabriel appeared to him, and Gabriel said to him, guess what, Zechariah, you're going to be a dad and he's going to be a forerunner of the Messiah. The Messianic age has dawned. Now, beyond the holy place was the most holy place. As I said, 30 by 30, again, very ornately decorated wood walls covered with gold, hammered on it, cherubim and seraphim. And in this place, separated by this curtain that was about seven inches thick, one day out of the year, the high priest, not a priest, but the high priest would go into that most holy place. In the most holy place was the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, a box made out of gold with a solid gold cover over it. On that cover, on that cover were two cherubim kneeling over it. This was the mercy seat. This was the presence of God himself in the Old Testament. Now, what was in the Ark of the Covenant? What was in the Ark of the Covenant were several significant things. First of all, there was a bowl of manna that God told Joshua to collect before they crossed over from the wilderness into the Promised Land. They put that in the Ark of the Covenant and it didn't spoil. Uh, during Moses' day, Moses' brother Aaron was the high priest. God chose Aaron as the high priest. Uh, there was an individual who claimed to be the high priest. He led a rebellion. And so God told Moses, well, we, I want to decide this once and for all, and I want everybody to see who the true high priest is. So I want you to take both of their staffs, put them in the holy place, whichever staff buds the next day, which other, whichever staff has little buds on it, this walking stick that has been removed from a tree for years and years, whichever one buds, that's the one 
who is my selected high priest. So the two staffs were put in the, the holy place. The next day, Moses, Aaron's staff hadn't just budded, but it had produced plants. It had produced almonds. There were almonds growing on Moses' staff. So after Aaron, or on Aaron's staff, after Aaron died, that staff of Aaron was placed into the Ark of the Covenant. So we had manna, we had Aaron's staff, and we also had a third item, the stone tablets of the law, which God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. Not the first copy, you might remember, but the second copy, the first copy got broken. So in this Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, covered by the mercy seat of the Lord, there were some very special things. And this most holy place could only be entered once a year. And that was on one of the most holy days for the Jews, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. When the Day of Atonement would come, the people would assemble before the high priest. The high priest would first have to make a sacrifice and offering for his own sins. Then there were specific rituals that he had to follow in order to put on the high priestly garment. And having accomplished all that, he would stand before the people. Um, in front of him would be two goats and the people would be assembled. They would be singing psalms, they would be praying. And as, as certain psalms were said, the high priest would raise up his hands, symbolizing the collection of the people's sins. And he would pick them up and he would hold them and he would put them and he would put his hands on the head of one of the goats. And then there would be a psalm that would be said, and it symbolized the collective sins of the people being placed on this goat. And then you know what happened to that goat? That goat was led out of the camp and free to go, signifying the sins of the assembly were removed from their presence. The other goat would be sacrificed and the high priest would take his blood. He would go into the holy place and then he would go behind the curtain into the most holy place and there he would take the blood of the goat and sprinkle it on the Ark of the Covenant, signifying that through the blood of this goat, the sins of the people had been removed. So it's a very beautiful picture, signifying two very important truths. Sin, our sin is removed, taken away from us. We don't see it anymore, and God doesn't see us anymore. And the payment and the penalty for our sins is also paid for. That's what Jesus Christ did for us. He paid the penalty of our sins, he removed our sins, and we also received, he also received the condemnation for our sins. So in this section, what I just read, the, uh, the, the book of Hebrews summarizes what I just talked about. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, so that he sets the stage, we don't have to follow, and I don't want you to follow, these Old Testament practices. It's not about the holy place. It's not about the most holy place. It's not about the high priest. It's not about the showbread. It's not about the light, the candles that are burning. It's not about the Ark of the Covenant. We have one, a high priest, Jesus Christ, who entered the most holy place in our behalf. That's what he says. And then in this next section, he's going to apply it. So what does it mean for us in our lives? And he's going to give us five exhortations as to how we walk, and really five descriptions of the attitude we will have as we walk. So five descriptions of our walk, Five descriptions of our attitude. The first one, let us draw near to God. That's the first exhortation for our walk. You jump down to the end. Let us hold unswervingly. So that's the second exhortation. I'm going to come back to those two. I want to talk about the attitudes. We're going to have a sincere heart. We're going to have full assurance of faith. We are going to have hearts sprinkled. And we're going to have our guilty conscience cleansed and our bodies washed. 
getting to the exhortations as to how we walk. So we draw near, uh, we hold unswervingly. What else? We spur one another on. We continue to meet together and we encourage one another. So five exhortations for our for our, our way to walk, five exhortations for the attitude and the manner. Let me take a look, first of all, at the exhortations for our attitudes. Draw near, assurance of faith, heart sprinkled, guilty conscience cleansed, bodies washed. Draw near to God, the author says, with a sincere faith. Now, that's kind of an interesting statement, isn't it? What is a sincere faith? A sincere faith is one who is not putting on pretense with God. A sincere faith is one who is not putting on airs with others. A sincere faith is one who trusts confidently in the promises of God. A sincere faith is one who uh, doesn't cling to our own righteousness, but a sincere faith clings to the promised hope and strength that we have in Christ. We have assurance of faith. Assurance of faith is the truth that because of Jesus Christ, we can come confidently before God's presence. Let me ask you, have you ever thought that God is being a little bit rough with you? Have you ever thought that, that God is kind of just sending you trials and tribulations just to see how you will act just to see how you will respond. And you put your hands up to heaven and you say, come on, God, really? Assurance of faith rests upon the truth that even though there might be trials and difficulties that come our way, we can rest in the promise of who God is and what God has done. And with that assurance of faith, we know the truth that all things will work together for our good, trusting in God and in who he is. Here's the next three, hearts sprinkled, conscience cleansed, bodies washed. So all three of these have to do with the concept of cleansing or the concept of washing. Now, here's a question. What is one practice that the New Testament church uses involving water? Well, it's baptism, right? Even though the writer to the Hebrews doesn't specifically say I'm talking about baptism, we can certainly make the application that there is baptism that is being implied. Our hearts are sprinkled. That is 1,400, 1500 years of Jewish tradition of the high priest going into the most holy place for 1,500 years with the blood of the goat, sprinkling it on the Ark of the Covenant, sprinkling it, sprinkling it on the mercy seat. What an incredible exhortation. What a wonderful reminder for us. Our hearts are sprinkled. Our guilty conscience is cleansed. Have you ever struggled with a guilty conscience? Have you ever struggled with things that you didn't do right, things that you should have done, words spoken, deeds done or not done. Here's the truth of living with a conscience cleansed. It's real simple. We just acknowledge our sin, and we then know that Jesus Christ has forgiven us freely and unconditionally. And of course, in baptism, we have our conscience cleansed by the healing waters of baptism, that each and every day we remember our baptism and we can be assured that in Jesus Christ our sins are forgiven. And our bodies are washed. Not washed in the sense of hopping in the shower in the morning, but our bodies are washed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We look in a mirror and we, we look into a mirror to see how we look, to see how the clothes match or don't match. Well. When we look into the mirror of God's eyes, he sees us, or when he looks at us rather, he sees us not for all of our sin and shortcomings, our faults and inabilities. He sees us for what we have become in his son. These are five incredible attitudes that we could have in our lives. A heart that is sincere, a heart that trusts in the promises of God, assurance of faith, knowing that trials and difficulties, though they might come, God still loves us through Jesus Christ. Our hearts sprinkled, our conscience cleansed, and 
our bodies washed. Attitudes. This is the way that we do walk. We draw near, we hold unswervingly, we spur one another on, we meet together, and we encourage one another. So we draw near to God. We come close to God. And coming close to God is something that we do on a daily basis. We come close to God to be reminded of who he is and what he has done. We hold unswervingly. We hold fast. What is the most important truth to hold fast to? We hold fast to the truth that I am a redeemed child of Jesus Christ. In my children's sermon for this week, I asked the kids to mention several things that they really, really liked and also things that they didn't like. And, and the answers were wide and varied from special food to pets to brothers and sisters to candy. Things that they didn't like. They didn't like fighting. They didn't like certain vegetables. They even didn't like some types of candy. But the truth of this or the significance of that is God doesn't look on us and have that same attitude. God doesn't look at us and says, I like you and I don't like you. I love you, but I don't love you. God loves us freely and unconditionally through Jesus Christ. So wherever you are at, whatever is going on in your life, know that God is welcoming you with the open hands of his grace, saying, you are my dear, precious child. So we, we draw near to God. We hold unservingly, we spur one another on, we gather together and we encourage. All three of those convey the thought of the importance of our fellowship. So we encourage one another. We encourage one another by understanding the burdens that we bring in our lives. Let me ask you, what burden are you carrying right here? Are you watching this by yourself or with somebody else? Uh, do you know what burdens are on the other person's heart that are next to you? Or maybe if you are watching it by yourself, the burdens that you are carrying might seem great, daunting, and overwhelming. But as we come together in God's, as we come together in the presence of God, we are reminded that God watches over us, that God cares for us, and he encourages us. And that, in turn, is how we can build each other up. Sometimes the right word at just the right time can help to spur a person on in their walk and in their life. Here's three takeaways. Grace empowers. Holding on is vital. And the fellowship strengthens. So God gives us this wonderful promise that he is with us always. Holding on to grace, God's free and unconditional love for us through Christ is so vital. To be reminded of it each and every day, to be assured of who he is and what he has done. And strengthened in turn through that relationship with him, through the Holy Spirit. God bless your walk. May you have your heart sincere. May your faith be assured. May your heart be sprinkled. May your conscience be cleansed and your bodies washed. And in light of that, then, draw near to God. Hold on to him. Spur one another on. Gather together with God's children and encourage each other in our faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day of grace and the blessings you have freely and so graciously showered down upon us through Christ. Thank you, Lord, for all of those who are watching. Lord, you know the burdens and cares that are in their hearts. I ask that you would lift them up. Point them to the hope, strength, and comfort that all of us have in you. As we pray the prayer that your Son taught us, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen. Have a great week. Next week, we're going to be taking a look at the wonderful truth that no matter what happens, no matter what's going on, Christ is still king and he still reigns. We'll see you then.